You're just in time for your weekly most comprehensive look at the world of business and economics. It's been about a year since we began the COVID-19 intervention measures. And on the front line of this was the banking sector. And we want to take stock on that with the Chief Executive Officer of the Kenya Bankers Association, Mr. Habil Olaka. Welcome on set. Thank you. Thank you. Habil, the latest data from the central bank indicates that 54% uh, of the banking sector loan book is now restructured. When I look at that vis-a-vis -vis the fact that we are at NPLs of 14%, sometimes I get a bit worried. Do you share the same? No, I don't. <laughs> I think it's because of the fact that um, the numbers may look a little bit worrying, but if you look at uh, where we are coming from and the expectation of the market from uh, you know, in, in terms of the banking sector's um, uh, uh, input into um, the effects of the crisis, I think it was expected. If you look at, for instance, the level of restructuring, one is uh, we need to acknowledge the, the, the combined effect of the regulator and the banking sector players. Um, the regulator came in very strongly to support the banks to be able to support the economy during the difficult times of the COVID-19. So some of the prudential guidelines, for example, are relaxed to enable banks be able to extend accommodation to their borrowers. No wonder banks have been able to restructure almost 50% of the, of the total portfolio. If you look at the total portfolio of $3 trillion, and uh, 1.6 trillion uh, being restructured, that's a significant proportion of the total portfolio. Um, it doesn't mean that um, uh, the portfolio is, is bad, it only means that um, at that particular point in time, the customers who are having specific challenges, either they are uh, supplier, um, uh, supply chains were disrupted, their demand, um, uh, on the demand side they were disrupted, employees could not come to work, all those challenges meant that they were not able to generate the cash flows to be able to repair the obligations. But they required that kind of accommodation to be able to come back and recover. So the 54% is not particularly very worrying. Now, if you look at the non-performing portfolio, um, you know, in terms of the quality of the portfolio, the 14% may look worrying because at the be beginning before the COVID, it was at about 9.9. .9. So deteriorating to 14.1, which it was at the end of the year, looks um, a little bit worrying. And so we are hopeful that uh, with the opening up of, of the economy, with the relaxation of the containment measures and things begin picking up, we'll see the quality beginning to improve as um, the SMEs that have been accommodated begin to pick up and therefore begin to repaying the obligations. If I recall very well, when this measures, uh, particularly the restructuring of uh, banking sector loans started, it was for a window period of about a year, which means that we are as effectively at the lapse of it. What happens beyond this? Yes, you're right in the sense that um, uh, Central Bank came in with um, the relaxation of the, um, the, the requirements of compliance to the strict prudential guidelines. And that was for the loans that are performing as at the 2nd of March last year and it was meant to be for a year, which meant that um, it was lapsing on the 1st of March this year. So we are just at the point when effectively the measures have, uh, have lapsed. Now in terms of going forward, um, um, uh, hopefully um, uh, you know, Central Bank may consider and give some additional extension to that date so that um, even if it's another six months or one year, to because you're not yet out of the woods, um, and uh, the customers will still need to be accommodated one way or another. And uh, it may be difficult for the banking sector to accommodate them while complying with the requirements of the prudential guidelines. So that is a discussion that um, uh, maybe Central Bank may consider. But even without the extension, banks will still find it necessary to continue accommodating the customers who especially just require some bit of hand-holding to get over the cliff because we see things opening up, and once things start opening up, most of these customers will be able to pick themselves up and start repaying. So it's an issue of are they going to start repaying in six months, are they going to start repaying in three months, or even a bit longer. So the banks should be able to extend that kind of accommodation. COVID started just as we were coming off the rate cap regime, and one of the realities that the rate cap regime precipitated was that then banks were a bit awash with liquidity. How much of a leverage was this in terms of tiding through the COVID-19 reality? When COVID struck, actually banks were, um, I would say, well cushioned from Tuangos. 
One, as you have mentioned, is the liquidity position of the banking sector. And um, it is because of the fact that you are coming out of the interest capping regime, which had been repealed uh, in November 2019. So after November 2019, that's when banks were beginning to pick up and start on lending the liquidity that they were already holding. They were washed with the liquidity. Now, so when COVID struck, banks were still in that position of being fairly liquid. Now, the other point that uh, we mentioned a little bit earlier in terms of the position that the banks were in was the adequate capitalization. Banks are fairly well capitalized because if you look at uh, the minimum requirement as per the, as per the um, regulatory capital, we're talking of 14.5%. Banks who are operating well above 18 in terms of the average um, capitalization of the banking sector, well above the, the minimum requirement by the regulatory uh, provisions. So on the two fronts in terms of liquidity and capitalization, banks were fairly well placed at the time when the COVID kicked in. And that gave a lot of stability to the banking sector to be able to absorb the shocks that were coming in with the with the with the advent of the of the COVID nineteen. Looking then at um, how we price risk, one of the questions we have now is that uh, we are aware banks have written to the market regulator in terms of guidance. I'm not aware that any feedback has come. As an association, how do you see the future unfolding as far as this pricing is concerned? One of the reasons why there was the interest capping. Uh, the argument was the fact that um, uh, banks were not pricing their customers on the basis of risk. So the need to introduce a, a, you know, a risk-based pricing mechanism within the sector was uh, quite uh, important and uh, important for uh, banks moving to this mode uh, with the repeal of the interest capping. So we are in that state of um, each bank trying to develop a model that would have the characteristics of uh, risk pricing. But as you'll appreciate, it's not easy to have a model that covers all the, the whole sector. So each bank will have to uh, uniquely define a model that still meets the overall requirement, but unique to its own specific needs and circumstances. So banks have developed various models um, uh, which they were in discussion with the central bank, you know, with the back and forth. Um, um, you know, so once they have got some generally agreed uh, model, each bank will then be able to offset itself. But even as we get that in place, banks are already having some way of pricing risk into their, into, into their portfolio. So it may not be the ideal, but at least you've got a starting point before you reach that ideal that has now been agreed between yourself and the, and the regulator. Banking shareholders watching this will, uh, of course, be wondering, from a NIMS perspective, uh, the fact that um, those who are still making savings and deposits expect their return in terms of interest. But when it comes to on lending, then banks are a bit constrained because of the risk profile out there. How do you see that position from a NIMS perspective in the banking sector uh, going forward? Because clearly, the market is a bit challenging as we speak. Going forward, I think growth is going to be generated from um, you know the, the the push by the private sector the productive segments of the economy are the ones that are going to start picking up and therefore driving growth uh, going forward um, the um, public sector spend led kind of growth may not be quite what we need at the moment now having said that in terms of the private sector led growth um, that will be fueled by credit and credit will obviously um, be coming from the banking sector. Now, the banks will be able to extend credit. The demand for credit will determine their demand for deposits to be able to fund that, uh, that credit growth. And therefore, the price dynamics between um, you know, what banks are lending at and what they are able to pick up determines you know, um, the, the margins that they are able to maintain on the difference between the deposits and, 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 and the lending. So I'll, the dynamics will be based on the pickup on the demand side in terms of access to uh, availability of credit and therefore the pool for the deposits to be, to be brought in by the banks. And so the dynamics will depend on how quickly we are able to get the private sector to drive that growth. I'm sure you're involved in this, the credit guarantee scheme. Uh, how far are we with this and um, in terms of the impact, what do you anticipate? Yeah, you know, one of the challenges that we saw during um, during the um, 
the, the you know the, the the development of the um, uh, the COVID nineteen was a fact that um, banks were more able to restructure the existing facilities rather than on lend fresh money. Now, on lending fresh money meant that um, uh, you know they uh, they had to assess the credit risk, and most of the um, borrowers, potential borrowers, were fairly high risk borrowers, and all that risk could not be borne by the banks. So there was need for a mechanism where the uh, the risk could be shared across banks taking part of the risk and part of it being offloaded to people who can be able to take that risk on board. Hence the need for such a scheme like the credit guarantee scheme where part of the risk will be borne by this credit guarantee scheme. Now, and the government took it up. The National Treasury drove the process. We saw some commitment in the budget to the capital for this credit guarantee scheme. There was three billion shillings that was allocated to the, to the fund. There was a cabinet decision to allocate up to 10 billion over the two-year period. So those are good developments because once it's capitalized, the structure is that um, banks will be able to leverage on the capitalization of the scheme and lend up to four times the capital injected into the scheme. So, And also in the scheme, um, there is talk of uh, donors showing interest in terms of bringing in uh, the capital. So you can imagine um, the stock of 12 billion coming in from the, from the from the from 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 the donors, there is 10 billion from the government. That's already 22 yeah. billion. Now banks are able to leverage on that four times. So we're talking about 80 to almost 90 yeah. billion shillings that is available for lending to the SMEs on the basis of a scheme that has been developed. Now, if this thing can be expanded further by either injecting in more capital from either the government or from the donors or from any other multilateral agencies that would be interested in supporting the credit growth for the supporting the SMEs, then we see this thing becoming much bigger. Right, and that point by Dr. Habilo Laka takes us to a short break. Business Redefined will be back with a lot more conversation on this subject, focusing on one year ever since we began restructuring banking sector loans. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Business Redefined. We are taking stock of one year since the banking sector began restructuring loans in light of COVID-19, and we are privileged to have the Chief Executive Officer of the Kenya Bankers Association, Dr. Habil Olaka. Welcome back on set. Thank you, thank you. Dr. Habil, one of the concerns that pervades out here right now is the fact that uh, there is a likelihood, in light of the risk profile that exists in the market, that banks could again revert to lending predominantly through government securities as opposed to the private sector. And that's a very rational position to take if you look at the risk out there. Now, um, what are your thoughts on this? Especially if you consider the fact that the government revenue outturn is really falling behind targets. I think any lender, uh, given the option between the government and the lending to the riskier SMEs, of course, you'll go for the low-risk government, which, um, you know, is, is effortless. And therefore, I think it requires quite a bit of effort from the government in terms of fiscal discipline to look for alternative um, uh, sources of bridging their, the, you know, the, the gap than raiding the domestic market. And one of the alternatives, of course, would be consider externalizing the debt so that you can give some room to the domestic market for the lenders to really direct the credit to the productive sectors of the economy in terms of the private sector. And as you mentioned a little bit earlier, the growth is most likely going to be driven by the private sector. And the private sector will be, uh, that growth will be fueled by credit from, from the banking sector. Now, if the market is going to be that um, banks will then have to decide between lending to this um, uh, the productive sector and putting the money in um, government um, you know, securities, I think the physical discipline comes in very strongly in terms of the fact that um, you try to create the market in a way that banks will be encouraged to put most of the money flow into the productive sectors rather than rather than to the government. Great, and I'm not sure I see much of that discipline when I look at the budget policy statement, but let's flip the coin and look at it now from the banking side. Over time, uh, Dr. Habil, the yield curve has been softening because of this fiscal consolidation you're talking about. Granted, we might see an uptick because of the appetite, but generally it's been going down. When you look at it now from the banking's perspective and what this means for your income, 
the private sector is not doing too well for understandable reasons, so the returns are not as good. Now the yield curve is softening on this side, clearly constraining your alternative income. What wiggle room do you see banks having to play with in terms of uh, diversifying their revenue streams? Given what is happening, um, um, and uh, as you have put it um, clearly, I mean the easier option is for banks to stash their access, excess liquidity in the government, government securities. And um, that would be because of the fact that um, uh, they don't have um, uh, better options in terms of um, supporting uh, the economy, especially the private sector for that matter. And that's where now I think uh, the innovation comes in because of the fact that um, uh, I think options have got to be brought in a way that um, uh, it makes it easier for the banks to direct their liquidity to the productive sectors of the economy. That requires them to have various options available in terms of lending to the, to the private sector. And so things like, for example, the risk profile of the borrowers. If the risk profile is like that they are, is, is perceived to be high, chances are that um, uh, the banks will not be as amenable to directing their liquidity in that direction, unless if there is a way of mitigating that risk. And we can think of many other innovative ways of trying to mitigate that risk to enable banks access, uh, extend liquidity to those specific segments. There are some segments that are particularly um, um, critical for the economic growth of the country. And now those segments also happen to be the ones that are most risky. Habil, I must ask you this question, and really out of public interest, listing on the CRB. What's the position here? Did we go back and uh, how, how are the numbers looking like, if, if at all you know? Because definitely, as you'd imagine, many Kenyans would be curious to understand how this is going on. I think the whole CRB framework um, uh, was meant to uh, support the credit market in the sense that um, uh, is the sharing information about the performance of uh, the borrower so that um, you can be able to, as a, as a lender, you can be able to assess um, based on some credible information. Now, truth be granted, at the time when COVID hit, uh, there was a push for the fact that um, uh, you know, the, the entities that were listed would find it much more difficult to access credit in the circumstances. And therefore, there was a move to suspend the listing of um, those that would have defaulted because of the COVID, which was a fair you know, move. But even though it's fair to the borrowers, I think in terms of the lenders, it makes the whole thing be very opaque. You don't have information on to, for you to be able to ac assess the credit worthiness of the borrower because the information is not being shared. But I think given what was happening in the market at that point in time, there was some give and take that players had to live with. Now that we are getting out of the COVID, I think the critical thing is to try to reinstate some of those um, mechanisms that enable the whole system to be able to work. So the information flow should start picking up again. The only thing is the fact that um, uh, I think we also need to in reintroduce it in a way that it does not penalize some specific um, uh, individuals or players who are significantly impacted by the COVID to enable them come out of the COVID, COVID crisis. Otherwise, if you're going to have that information just onboarded and therefore uh, used for purposes of denying the borrower access to credit, it becomes counterproductive. And I think the critical thing is uh, the discipline also of the players in the sense that that information that you have about a player's performance during that period of COVID does not mean that that person is not credit worthy. It's just useful information for you to be able to assess the capacity of the borrower to be able to repay going forward, which does not necessarily depend on uh, his performance over the COVID period. One of the key sources of income for banks, aside from interest, is uh, foreign exchange. And uh, if you remember last year, we had a bit of um, a very wild Q4, Q3 going into Q4, but now we've seen the stabilization of the shilling. What's your outlook and how do you think this will impact the banking sector? we should load the efforts that were put in by the regulator and that's the central bank in terms of price stability and in particular in this case you're talking about the exchange rate as a price the stabilization of that exchange rate you see if the exchange rate is not stable 
the actions of the players in the market make it even more um, unstable, partly because they cannot anticipate the price of, of, of the dollar, for example, tomorrow. If I'm an importer and um, the price is unstable, what I do is that um, I try to buy the, sh the, the dollar today at a higher price because I anticipate the dollar to be yeah, higher yeah. in terms of um, term of the exchange rate tomorrow. And if I'm an exporter and uh, I'm also holding on to some dollar proceeds, I will hold on to them because I anticipate the dollar to be give me more shillings tomorrow. The actions of these players in the market just make the shilling even worsen, not because of an economic activity, but because of the actions of the players. Now, and that's why it's important for the shilling to be stabilized. The stability of the market is very, very important in terms of sending signals to the players and also enabling the market to operate in an efficient way. So I think the actions taken by the central bank over this period have are laudable in the sense that we have seen a very stable shilling. There were some times when there was a bit of volatility, but quickly actions brought the shilling back to stability. Uh, my outlook in terms of um, going forward Central Bank has got adequate reserves to be able to intervene at any point when the shilling appears to be to be becoming volatile, maintain and achieve the stability and, and, the, and then pull out. So as long as you have got adequate reserves and um, from the last figures I saw, we have got quite a bit of, uh, in terms of the import cover, we have got adequate and therefore we should be able to stabilize the shilling going forward for 2021 and possibly even into 2022. Right, on that point by Dr. Habilo Laka takes us to the close of our conversation on Business Redefined, where we have, we have been taking stock, I should say, of uh, one year ever since the banking sector began restructuring and reprofiling loans in light of the COVID-19 shock. Up next is the Markets Report.